know who's drowned. It's us. As the night deepened, Huck began to nod and presently to snore. Joe followed next. Tom lay upon his elbow motionless for some time, watching the two intently. Then he tiptoed his way cautiously among the trees till he felt that he was out of hearing and straightway broke into a keen run. Chapter 15 A few minutes later, Tom was in the shoal water of the bar, wading toward the Illinois shore. Before the depth reached his middle, he was halfway over. The current would permit no more wading now, so he struck out confidently to swim the remaining hundred yards. He swam quartering upstream, but still was swept downward rather faster than he had expected. However, he reached the shore finally and drifted along till he found a low place and drew himself out. He put his hand on his jacket pocket, finding his piece of bark safe, and then struck through the woods, following the shore with streaming garments. Shortly before ten o'clock he came out into an open place opposite the village, and saw the ferry-boat lying in the shadow of the trees and the high bank. Everything was quiet under the blinking stars. He crept down the bank, watching with all his eyes, slipped into the water, swam three or four strokes, and climbed into the skiff that did yawl duty at the boat's stern. He laid himself down under the thwarts and waited, panting. Presently the cracked bell tapped, and a voice gave the order to cast off. A moment or two later the skiff's head was standing high up against the boat's swell, and the voyage was begun. Tom felt happy in his success, for he knew it was the boat's last trip for the night. At the end of a long twelve or fifteen minutes the wheels stopped, and Tom slipped overboard and swam ashore in the dusk, landing fifty yards downstream, out of danger of possible stragglers. He flew along unfrequented alleys, and shortly found himself at his aunt's back fence. He climbed over, approached the L, and looked in at the sitting-room window, for a light was burning there. There sat Aunt Polly, Sid, Mary, and Joe Harper's mother, grouped together, talking. They were by the bed, and the bed was between them and the door. Tom went to the door and began to softly lift the latch. Then he pressed gently, and the door yielded a crack. He continued pushing cautiously and quaking every time it creaked, till he judged he might squeeze through on his knees. So he put his head through and began, warily. "'What makes the candle blow so?' said Aunt Polly. Tom hurried up. "'Why, that door's open, I believe. Why, of course it is. No end of strange things now. Go along and shut it, Sid.' Tom disappeared under the bed just in time. He lay and breathed himself for a time, and then crept to where he could almost touch his aunt's foot. "'But as I was saying,' said Aunt Polly, "'he weren't bad, so to say, only mischievous, only just giddy and harem scarum, you know. He weren't any more responsible than a colt. He never meant any harm, and he was the best-hearted boy that ever was.' And she began to cry. "'It was just so with my Joe always full of his devilment, and up to every kind of mischief, but he was just as unselfish and kind as he could be, 
And laws bless me, to think I went and whipped him for taking that cream, never once recollecting that I throwed it out myself because it was sour, and I never to see him again in this world, never, 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 poor abused boy. And Mrs. Harper sobbed, as if her heart would break. I hope Tom's better off where he is, said Sid. But if he'd been better, in some ways... Sid! Tom felt the glare of the old lady's eye, though he could not see it. Not a word against my Tom now that he's gone. God'll take care of him. Never you trouble yourself, sir. Oh, Mrs. Harper, I don't know how to give him up. I don't know how to give him up. He was such a comfort to me, although he tormented my old heart out of me most. The Lord giveth, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But it's so hard. Oh, it's so hard. Only last Saturday my Joe busted a firecracker right under my nose, and I knocked him sprawling. Little did I know then how soon. Oh, if it was to do over again, I'd hug him and bless him for it. Yes, 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 I know just how you feel, Mrs. Harper. I know just exactly how you feel. No longer ago than yesterday noon my Tom took and filled the cat full of painkiller, and I did think the critter would tear the house down. And God forgive me, I cracked Tom's head with my thimble, poor boy. Poor dead boy. But he's out of all his troubles now. And the last words I ever heard him say was to reproach— but this memory was too much for the old lady, and she broke entirely down. Tom was snuffling now himself, and more in pity of himself than anybody else. He could hear Mary crying and putting in a kindly word for him from time to time. He began to have a nobler opinion of himself than ever before. Still, he was sufficiently touched by his aunt's grief to long to rush out from under the bed and overwhelm her with joy, and the theatrical gorgeousness of the thing appealed strongly to his nature, too, but he resisted and lay still. He went on listening, and gathering, by odds and ends, that it was conjectured at first that the boys had got drowned while taking a swim. Then the small raft had been missed. Next, certain boys said the missing lads had promised that the village should hear something soon. The wise heads had put this and that together, and decided that the boys had gone off on that raft and would turn up at the next town below presently. But toward noon the raft had been found, lodged against the Missouri shore some five or six miles below the village, and then hope perished. They must be drowned, else hunger would have driven them home by nightfall, if not sooner. It was believed that the search for the bodies had been a fruitless effort merely because the drowning must have occurred in mid-channel, since the boys, being good swimmers, would otherwise have escaped to shore. This was Wednesday night. If the bodies continued missing until Sunday, all hope would be given over, and the funerals would be preached on that morning. Tom shuddered. Mrs. Harper gave a sobbing good night and turned to go. Then, with a mutual impulse, the two bereaved women flung themselves into each other's arms and had a good consoling cry, and then parted. Aunt Polly was tender far beyond her wont in her good night to Sid and Mary. Sid snuffled a bit, and Mary went off crying with all her heart. Aunt Polly knelt down and prayed for Tom so touchingly, so appealingly, and with such measureless love in her words and her old trembling voice, that he was weltering in tears again, long before she was through. He had to keep still long after she went to bed, for she kept making broken-hearted ejaculations from time to time, tossing unrestfully, and turning over. But at last she was still, only moaning a little in her sleep. Now the boy stole out, rose gradually by the bedside, shaded the candlelight with his hand, and stood regarding her. His heart was full of pity for her. He took out his sycamore scroll and placed it by the candle. But something occurred to him, and he lingered, considering. His face lighted with a happy solution of his thought. He put the bark hastily in his pocket, 
Then he bent over and kissed the faded lips, and straightway made his stealthy exit, latching the door behind him. He threaded his way back to the ferry landing, found nobody at large there, and walked boldly on board the boat, for he knew she was tenantless, except that there was a watchman, who always turned in and slept like a graven image. He untied the skiff at the stern, slipped into it, and was soon rowing consciously upstream. When he had pulled a mile above the village, he started quartering across and bent himself stoutly to his work. He hit the landing on the other side neatly, for this was a familiar bit of work to him. He was moved to capture the skiff, arguing that it might be considered a ship, and therefore legitimate prey for a pirate but he knew a thorough search would be made for it, and that might end in revelations. So he stepped ashore and entered the woods. He sat down and took a long rest, torturing himself meanwhile to keep awake, and then started wearily down the home stretch. The night was far spent. It was broad daylight before he found himself fairly abreast the island bar. He rested again until the sun was well up and gilding the great river with its splendor, and then he plunged into the stream. A little later he paused, dripping, upon the threshold of the camp, and heard Joe say, No, Tom's true blue hug, and he'll come back. He won't desert. He knows that would be a disgrace to a pirate, and Tom's too proud for that sort of thing. He's up to something or other. Now I wonder what? Well, the things is ours anyway, ain't they? Pretty near, but not yet, Huck. The writing says they are if he ain't back here to breakfast. Which he is? exclaimed Tom, with a fine dramatic effect, stepping grandly into camp. A sumptuous breakfast of bacon and fish was shortly provided, and as the boys set to work upon it, Tom recounted and adorned his adventures. They were a vain and boastful company of heroes when the tale was done. Then Tom hid himself away in a shady nook to sleep till noon, and the other pirates got ready to fish and explore. There came a quivering glow that vaguely revealed the foliage for a moment. Then a faint moan came sighing through the branches of the forest. Now a weird flash turned night into day. A deep peal of thunder went rolling and tumbling down the heavens and lost itself in sullen rumblings in the distance. Another fierce glare lit up the forest, and an instant crash followed that seemed to rend the treetops right over the boys' heads. Quick, boys, go for the tent! exclaimed Tom, 